the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me after we pass through five different airlocks is my co-host and fellow heckler, Kyle J.C.R.B. Krause. <laughs> yes, we are like uh, Statler and Waldorf over here. Totally. Absolutely. Sitting up in the high box, <laughs> thinking of witty one-liners that we totally don't put in and post because we couldn't think anything off the top of our heads. <clears throat> totally not. Not at all. It's not like MST3K is a ripoff of Statler and Waldorf or a ripoff of like freaking Shakespeare. <laughs> but hey, it's close. They are an evolution. I know. I'm joking. Of a concept. I'm but joking. we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm obviously joking because we're, we're, we're talking about that. But we're talking about that later, not right now. <laughs> How are you, sir? What have you been up to? Uh, I'm doing okay. It's a very uh, rainy and uh, kind of overcast and dark day here, which is a... Uh, kind of a rarity in the phoenix area where i live so uh it's pretty nice i like it i like rainy dark (laughs) cloudy weather it's delightful i could go with more of it i don't know if i want too much of it i'd have never had too much of it i don't know how much is too much for me but i like it i like it better than the sun the sun can 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 burn for all I care. Oh wait, that's what it does. Never mind. Well, I have good news for you. It plans on doing that for a few more billion years. <laughs> ah, dang it, Ian! You're ruining it for me. I was hoping it would burn out. That's what I meant to say. And then we'd all just suffer in darkness. And then, uh, I, anyway, go ahead. What What are you up to, Ian? Well, before we get to that, I hate to say it, but we're not going to be able to enjoy the darkness because the last model I saw said the sun, as it burned out, would expand and consume the Earth entirely. So, even if we've managed to exist that long, it ain't going to work out. So, Oh, cool. So it's like Sephiroth casting Meteor and the sun yeah, yeah, expanding yeah, yeah, yeah. and consuming the entire solar system. It sounds great. I like it. I'm ready. Well, good. Giant... I'll meet you in the next, you know, four billion years. We'll set up some lawn chairs, watch it roll in. Giant Meteor 2020. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> uh, I've been doing all right. Uh, excited to be playing Smash Brothers. We're recording this before the game comes out. Indeed. Quite possibly we'll have streamed it together by the time you're listening to this. I don't know. We'll see. The future is full of possibilities. Are you telling me I got to buy this game, Ian? Are you yeah, t- acquire are, it however you want. We, you t- I need to smash are, somebody. Oh, uh, that's that's very mean of you to smash somebody. I don't it's know. It's the if name I, of the game, I, literally. I don't, I don't know if I want to get smashed by you. Now well, we'll, we'll, fig- we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been working on Sonic stuff. Surprise, surprise. Some of which I can't talk about or even hint at. Are you a knowing smile kind of guy these days? I am hashtag knowing smiling all over the place. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. What can you talk about, Ian? Uh, I can talk about today's Bumble Raffle winner. Okay, hey, that sounds great. Let's do that. Now, if you want to win a prize from us on the Bumble Raffle, you can either write into us at bumblecast at yahoo.com for each episode that you want to take a chance in, or you can be a patron over at patreon.com backslash bumblecast, and you will be automatically entered into every single drawing. So this episode's winner is... Digama F. Wow! Or, I, 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 think, I think that's right. I'm not sure, Ian. What it, I assumed it was Digamma. Digamma... Daigama, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for pronouncing your name. I'm pretty sure we actually did get like a pronunciation key for this name, and I have just completely like f- forgotten how to pronounce it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Congratulations, you! You've won a thing. <laughs> you know, you know who you are. We'll we'll, we'll get be in contacting touch. Contacting you soon, so you know what that thing is. It's a nice thing. It's a very cool thing. You'll have fun with it. At least I hope so. All right, Ian. Let's go on to the main meat of this episode let's head down that long corridor and into the theater so we can talk about mystery science theater 3000 yeah which i haven't seen in years (laughs) well ian let me regale you with the tales of mst3k please do as it is known as it is known by its fans who are who are known as misties which is kind of silly. 
But I like well, it. It's a silly show. So it is a very silly show. But uh, of course, for uh, for those of you who know, and those of you who do not know, Mystery Science Theater three thousand is a very long running uh, TV show slash movie, weekly movie, kind of regular movie, uh, where the basic concept which is outlined in the theme song which is very handy you can jump into any episode and immediately get the concept uh where a man is shot into space and forced against his will by mad scientists to watch horrible movies and uh as a result of being shot into space uh in a satellite in space onto a satellite in space i should say uh as a result of that he has created robot pals to uh, watch the movies with and keep him company so he doesn't go completely crazy. <laughs> At least that was the original concept for the show. Uh, in since the end, the, they all kind of drove each other crazy. In the end, the, in the end, drive, yes. So. In the end, yes. And of course, the robots are, like, they're just robots because they, or they're called robots because they look like robots. But, I mean, as far as they're concerned, they're just, like, more people. They're not really programmed <laughs> They're just, they have, they have a level of humanity that uh, robots normally would not have, I would say, which is Imagine also what, Orbot and Cubot with more snark, which is also what makes them great. Yes. So uh, that's the basic concept of the show. And it really hasn't changed too much. It's still just a guy in space being sent terrible movies to watch. And we watch along with him and they sit in the corner in shadow and make funny jokes. The robots and the guy. And uh, I remember it's great. watching a making of mm-hmm. years ago and how it isn't just them watching it the one time and recording everything. They have to watch these horrible movies <laughs> multiple times to make sure that there's like enough jokes to get all the way through because eventually they hit a point where it's just, it's so bad. You can't really <laughs> respond so sometimes the fact that they soldier through these things multiple <laughs> times, they do. In I fact, salute you, gentlemen. They do, in fact, script them out. Sadly, it is not improv comedy, but uh, it's very natural and well done. Regardless, um, there is one exception to that rule, though, Ian, and that was oh. the very first season, which um, was actually on a local local. Um, local TV station in Minnesota, which is where the show, the show got to start uh, as a local, uh, a local show on a Minnesota affiliate, basically intended to just fill time. They had a, the (laughs) channel, (laughs) the channel, the channel had a vault, vault full of terrible movies. And the idea was, well, we could show these terrible movies or we could, show these terrible movies and make fun of them at the same time because we know these movies are bad the people watching know these movies are bad what if we uh highlight the fact that these movies are bad <laughs> with just some silly with just some silly jokes and Let's uh, spin the straw into gold yeah um and none of those episodes had pre-written jokes they were all done off the top of off the top of their heads there were some really weird things going on in that early season where, uh, like, for example, there was one movie where uh, Joel was in the theater by himself the entire time. <laughs> oh, God. It was just him. And obviously, he's just making riffs by himself. He's not doing, he doesn't have anyone to play off of. It's a very awkward episode. <laughs> And there's a few other things like that where where some of the actors have to leave or like they have other obligations and this is a local TV station thing. They're not really in this to it's not super they didn't realize how big and serious it would become eventually. Oh, of course not. Why would you? Yeah. And this was the early 80s, so the first or late 80s, sorry. So the first 3 episodes for Mm, about like 28 years were unrecorded. Oh, I no. think, I think episode one and two finally got a release about a year ago through the, uh, 
uh, MST3K Kickstarter, uh, the one that brought the show back a year ago, or a couple years ago now. But uh, I think before that, there was only like very small clips that had been released previously. So I think the only episode missing now is episode three. And I don't know, I don't know if they're ever going to bring that one out or not, but uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating, but they've managed to keep all the rest of them. And there's some really good episodes of that early season too. Like the last one is the, the legend of a dinosaur. And there's some good material in there for them to work with. It's like a, it's a Japanese monster movie, kind of like a Loch Ness monster take, but it's Japanese and, uh. It's pretty silly. So there's a lot of material for them to play with. So that's that's a pretty good highlight for season zero, as it's known. But then they now, went on to Comedy Central. Exploded from there. Help me out, because I, I want to say I remember there being other human protagonists besides Joel. Correct. Okay. I, I Because everybody refers to Joel directly. I'm like, I could have sworn there were other people. Yeah. And... It's been so long since I saw it, and I didn't really see it with any kind of continuity. I'm like, uh... (laughs) Joel is the creator of the show. He started... He was there for the KTMA season zero years, or year, and then moved on as the host of the show through halfway through season five. Uh, He decided to leave. He wanted to pursue other things, I guess. And uh, into into his stead stepped... Uh, Mike Nelson, who is who'd been head writer of the show since they moved to cable, I think. And uh, it's always been a long standing thing of who's better, Mike or Joel. Or now there's Jonah, but I don't think people really uh, people aren't really fighting about who's better these days, thankfully. But there was uh, it was mid 90s Internet. There was a lot of mid 90s Internet flame wars about who was better, Mike or Joel. <laughs> I remember, I miss when the internet was uh, when people on the internet argued about things like that. I miss those times. They still do. It's just more <laughs> with more anger and vitriol and threats of violence. And it's more visible. It's not on BBSs and Usenet where nobody knows how to get to them except for the ner- <laughs> except for the nerdiest of nerds. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They don't do. <laughs> that's where. That's where it was all all happening. But, uh, so, but that is, um, after 10 seasons, the show ended in 1999. Oh, shut up. Yeah, 99. Really? Yeah. And from there, kind of everyone on the show went kind of quiet until the mid 2000s when Rift Tracks became a thing. And then, uh, Joel went on to create another movie riffing, uh, troupe called Cinematic Titanic which uh released a few a few episodes about a dozen episodes for that. Uh Rift Tracks is still going strong and has tons of commentaries for all sorts of freaking movies. It's it's pretty insane just how much ground Rift Tracks has covered. But uh and then a couple of years ago Joel decided to just bring back MST3K. It's been almost 30 years. Uh people are still talking about MST3K. People are still watching it. People still love it. People are still streaming it on Netflix because Netflix has seen pretty pretty major watch numbers for old MST3K episodes, which I think is why they uh, were so happy to pick up the new seasons. So, brought it back a couple of years ago with a new host, Jonah Ray, who's uh, also great. I love all the hosts. I can't I can't pick a favorite Ian. I can't do it. And uh, well, also- Crow is the answer. So. Oh, Excuse okay. me, Crow. <laughs> <laughs> also brought in uh, Felicia Day and uh, Patton Oswalt, so some fairly big, well-known names. Well, at that point, I would imagine they could get that kind of attention. Yeah, and well, I mean, these people were like, uh, "Yeah, we love MST3K. We grew up watching it. We want to be on it." So, yeah, and uh, it's pretty much just. It slid right back into being just as great as I remember it being. I I have I'm like, wow, this is like this is still great. I mean, there's definitely differences. The riffing is a lot snappier, a lot faster. It's more millennial paced. <laughs> but uh it it's still good. 
and it's still awesome. So I'm, I've been digging the new season, especially the, especially these uh, the new season that just came out a couple weeks ago. It's pretty excellent, and it's uh, designed for binge watching, which is also great. <laughs> and they're sticking to the formula of like the old B movie stuff. They're not moving into newer movies, right? Um, they have done some newer movies, like for example, the um. The latest season, the second episode was Atlantic Rim, which is the asylum take on Pacific Rim. Uh, that would be probably the newest movie they've ever done. And also one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, the movie's intentionally bad, so it's really hard to tell <laughs> if it's actually oh, now bad. Now we're doing Inception levels of meta commentary. Yeah, I know. And But here's the thing. It's actually, for me, it was one of the stronger episodes of the season. I, I, and... Usually when a movie knows it's bad or it is intentionally bad, it doesn't work quite as well for MST3K. But, I mean, I think the Asylum movie, I think that particular Asylum movie is even worse than they were intending. (laughs) That might be why. That might be why it's so bad. But, (laughs) regardless, that was a great episode. Um, Like, the first episode... The first episode might be one of the most high profile movies they've ever done, which was Mac Mac and me, the E.T. ripoff. OK, with with the McDonald's tie in. I should say McDonald's and Coca-Cola tie in. It, it, it's it's a terrible movie. And yet it's like imminently entertaining just on its own. You don't even need MST3K, but the MST3K level, the riffing adds a whole new level to it which is uh which is excellent it works out really well and gives us a really great uh season long running gag where the characters will all go really nice it, it it's funnier i can't context, i can't i can't recreate the joke but it's really nice it's it, it's really nice ian <laughs> i get you i get you <laughs> so but uh that's sort of the rundown of mst3k from my perspective, I suppose. I Like I said, I know I watched it way back in the day when I was younger than I thought I was. Oh, <laughs> God. But, uh, yeah, it was always fun. And you know, looking back on it and giving all that you have informed me of, it's just, it makes me happy. It's just a bunch of dudes doing goofy stuff and succeeding at it. Yeah. It's just pure. It's... <laughs> good <laughs> the budget has gone up tremendously though which i would think so but i hope they still keep like the miniatures but and they the do stop yeah. motion stuff yeah they keep a lot of miniatures but the mini the miniatures are actually the miniatures are done by people who actually know what they're doing instead of just some <laughs> except in, instead of just some random dudes in a warehouse in the middle of minnesota which is a good thing and a bad thing. I kind of like the uh, the feel of like people who don't really know what they're doing with miniatures doing miniature stuff. But at the same time, it is nice to see some really good detail work on like certain spaceships and and the uh, animation and movement and stuff of this mm-hmm. of uh, of the miniatures. But I don't know. It's still fun. There's still a lot to love about it, and uh, I have definitely the, uh... enjoyed it. Is it the original puppets, or have they been rebuilt as well? Uh, I gotta be honest, I'm not sure. There were several uh, puppets. There was more than just one set. Sure. But uh, they do have more points of articulation, I suppose. Uh, it used to be that Tom Servo's arms were just slinkies and springs, and they had no yes. movement. There was no movement, so he'd he'd like flop or he'd. He'd spin around and his arms would just flop all over the place. Yes. Uh, he has actual arm movement now. Which I don't is, know if I like which that. Which can be a good or a bad thing. I guess it kind of depends. There might be different versions of the I haven't really watched. I haven't really sat there and just watched his arms. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just haven't sat there and just studied his arm movements. But there might be certain puppets where he still has the slinky arms. And then other ones where he has solid arms with more movement but uh crow has sometimes has legs which he also did in the uh original run he would have legs sometimes but seems to have them more often now and there seems to be three puppeteers for each 
puppet instead of just one. Oh, wow. So I think there's a bit more going on puppet wise <laughs> in there. So, but yeah, there's definitely a higher budget, obviously more well-known people on board, but Joel is still kind of the main guy. He's the one who spearheaded the whole thing. So it's still his baby and it's still just as great as it used to be, as it always was. Excellent. Yep. And for folks who have somehow not seen this cultural phenomenon, where can they find it? Oh, jeez. Like, <laughs> Netflix is probably the easiest way. Um, as far as what I, where I'd suggest to, what I would suggest to watch. Um, the new seasons are really good. They're a lot of fun. Um, the first episode of the 11th season, which is the first season of The Return, um, is called Reptilicus, which is a terrible movie. But the episode is glorious. It's like they pay, they they really nailed down like the perfect movie to come back with. Like if you're gonna bring back MST3K, you got and you got to show that this new cast and all these new people who are involved still have have still got it and still know what they're doing. They picked the perfect movie to start off with because it's hilarious. Um, and then the first episode of this season, Mac and Me, the movie is. Like, it's terrible, but it's also insanely watchable. So that's, those are definitely two episodes I'd recommend. Going back to the original run, uh, Pod People is a great one. The two Godzilla movies are kind of, the movies themselves can be a little boring, but there's also a lot of really good jokes and a lot of really good moments where just silly crap happens. Like, the... You know that legendary scene where Godzilla is just doing like a tail ride across yes. the ground? <laughs> that is not a tail ride, sir. That is a double flying kick. That's a flying kick. Yeah, it's a flying Clearly. kick. Clearly. It's a flying kick with <laughs> Godzilla's riding on his tail. Uh, that is in one of the episodes, and it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, there's also one scene where Godzilla is sitting on a rock, and it looks like he's sitting on the throne. <laughs> so that's always he fun. is the king of all monsters <laughs> I, i'm not talking about that kind of throne sir i know i'm talking about I the know. one made of por porcelain <laughs> it's pretty hysterical uh of course standbys good standbys include space mutant space mutiny sorry i can't speak today um let's see what else uh time chasers and uh overdrawn at the memory bank basically the trifecta of the season eight closers, the last three episodes of season eight are pretty amazing. Uh, one of them has overdrawn at the memory bank has uh Raul Julia doing his Raul Julia ist. <laughs> so M Bison himself is there or Gomez Adams, if you prefer, whichever one uh, M Gomez. There we go. <laughs> yes. Let's do that. Uh, geez. What else? Uh, Mitchell is also really good. That was the season five uh, episode where Joel left and Mike came on board. Uh, the first episode where Mike was on, I can't remember what the name of it was. I can't remember the name of the movie. I, it's some kind of weird space Western. It's like a Western on an alien planet or something. I think something weird going on there. Um, that was also great. Laser blast to the closer of season seven. <laughs> that has, that one is uh probably has some of the more legendary riffs um yeah those are just some of the episodes that i really love what are some of your favorite episodes out there if you're listening i i always like talking about mst3k it's always fun yeah comment in the youtube comments comment over on the patreon page let us know interact with us yeah hey let me know what some of your favorite episodes are i always like I there's I haven't watched all of them sadly. I'm very much I'm still very much I still have quite a few holes in my watching of the series, but uh Manos I suppose is one that we have to mention. Even though I really don't think it's amazing like some people seem to think it is. Uh Manos the Hands of Fate, considered one of the worst movies ever made, and it's bad. 
Don't get me wrong. It's very bad, but it commits the cardinal sin of bad movies, Ian. And do you know what that is? I do not. Tell me, Father Kyle. It's very boring. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. It has certain. It has some moments where it's just like, what the heck is going on? This is really weird. But then other times it's just really freaking boring. So that's... I'm, I don't think it... Honestly, when movies... Movies can be bad. I don't mind a bad movie. But if it's boring, then it's it's just a slog. I hate when a movie is boring and there's nothing happening. If your movie's terrible, but you at least got things happening and there's some really stupid crap going on, but it's still... Like, there's still crap going on, then I'm all in. I'm fine with that. But if your movie's boring, then I'm just like... I'm checked out. Even... Sometimes even MST3K can't save it. Like, there was a German version of Hamlet that they did in uh, in the last season. And that movie is practically unwatchable. It's so boring. It's black and white. I was, was going to say, Hamlet can drag if you don't have the right cast. They and... didn't. They didn't. And <laughs> it's black and white. It was originally in German, so it's... it's uh, well, not, at least not, we have the subtitles already it, written. No, no, no. It's not subtitles. It's... Uh, what's it called? It's dubbed. Oh, no. It's a really bad dub of a really low-budget German production of Hamlet. Why? The sets... Okay. Are, the sets are just dark, gray, like, just really bad-looking stone and just shadows. And it, it's it's just not good at all. And they really tried. They really tried to make it entertaining. And they did their best, but it's really difficult to pull that movie out of <laughs> out of the depths of yeah. awfulness. It's bad. It's so bad. It's one of the worst movies they've ever done. But the host segments are uh, are wonderful, so they did some uh they did some Shakespeare pastiches for the uh host segments in between in between commercials and stuff, which is uh those are very fun. But the movie itself is just a slog. Even with them, it's 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 practically unwatchable. That's the worst episode that I've seen. So if you want to uh torture yourself, I suggest that episode. It's great. <laughs> it's delightful. You know what? It's still even it just just to see it, it is worth it. To be honest with you, <laughs> it's like man, how can a movie be so boring and so bad and so just just terrible to look at? There's nothing interesting going on. The acting is awful. The dubbing is terrible. It's. It, it just has nothing going for it. So It's like you're saying everyone should have sunburn at least once just to experience. I, I mean, you, you gotta have like a low point to know where the high points are. You know what I mean? There can be no joy without despair. Exactly. You have to figure out like, okay, like where, where, how bad is bad? Oh, <laughs> It's right That's here. The answer. <laughs> Here's bad. Right here. I found bad. All right. Everything else beyond this, this is freaking great. <laughs> if a movie's incomprehensible, but it there's but it's fun and there's still some silly stuff happening, or like, I don't know, some interesting things happening, then it's fine. But if your movie's just dull, then don't even bother. <laughs> so that's my take on it, but I still I still love it. Even even that episode I still love just because like you got to admire the fact that they even took it on like they're just like okay, this is the best we can get for Shakespeare. Let's let's just go with it and see what we can make of it. But it's terrible. It's awful. <laughs> and I think we've uh, officially ran out of steam on this subject, but Check out MST3K if you haven't. The new episodes are only 80 minutes long, so not too much of a time investment there. And, uh... a fair bit over a weekend. And, hey, it's just a show. You should really just relax. So don't worry about the story. <laughs> don't worry about the plot. Don't worry about how the, that, how the guy eats and breathes 
and other science facts. Science it's, stuff. It's, ah. it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Just enjoy the ride. That's what MST3K is all about. Just enjoy the ride. Are we ready to move on to Q&A, Ian? No, we're not, because we actually have an ad for this episode. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Brought to us by our good friend Daniel H., who is always so wonderfully generous with the show. And he'd like to say that the holidays are here. Yes, they are. I hope and pray that all of you are listening are having a great time. But if we could, let's take a moment to help those that could use a boost this season. And maybe have a little fun at the same time. I'm talking, of course, about Extra Life. From the U.S. to Canada, Extra Life has helped raise over $40 million for Children's Miracle Network Hospital. It funds everything from critical treatments to pediatric equipment to research and training. Whether you donate to or start a stream, hit that link below and learn more on how to help or on how to join in. Happy holidays. Stay warm. Get your cocoa on. God bless us, everyone, and all that jazz. Head over to www.extra-life.org. Yep, extra-life.org, extra-life.org, or hyphen life, whichever you want. Uh, they do some really great things, and... Um... Actually, a friend of mine who hosts a show on the KNGI network, um, he does every year he does a charity live stream for Extra Life uh, for his uh, local children's hospital in San Diego. And he's raised a good, geez, I want to say he's done a good four or five thousand dollars just on his own good over man. time. He's done a couple. He's done this for geez, five or six years, something like that. I want to say somewhere around there. He's been doing it for a while. So I think over the lifetime he's raced around that much. And uh, it's a really good, uh, it's a really good cause. So definitely check out extra hyphen life.org. So what, what did you have something to add again? Nope. Alrighty. Let's go on to the Q and a, if you want to have your question answered here on the show, either tweet to us at Bumblecast. Write to us at bumblecast at yahoo.com, comment in the uh, comment sections of any of the YouTube videos, or post on the Patreon page, pretty much wherever. We'll find it. We'll put it on the show. Eventually. Be patient. And if we don't put it on the show after a long time, let me know, because sometimes that happens. All right. First up, we got one from none other than our good buddy and a priority Q&A uh, submitter, Scruffy Matt. Says in the intro to the Flash, we are told, "My name is Barry Allen, and I'm the fastest man alive." In the epically '90s theme song for the Sonic the Hedgehog Sad AM cartoon, Sonic is similarly described similarly described as being the fastest thing alive. So, who would win if the two raced each other? Oh, I get this question all the time. I feel like we probably touched on it on a Bumblecast of the past. I don't. Rem- um, I don't remember. I don't know if we ever have. We might. I'd be surprised if we didn't. I'm going to be obtuse at first and say which Barry and which Sonic, or rather which <laughs> Flash and which Sonic, uh-huh. because there's been a bunch of different Flashes, and each one has different speeds and different abilities given what era of comics they're in, and which version of Sonic in what media, because their speeds vary from iteration to iteration, and blah, 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 super nerdy, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah, roundabout, blah, blah, blah. Direct answer. <laughs> I'm going to have to give it to Flash. Uh, yeah, he's the only one who's managed to travel through time. Right. On his own, with under his own power. Sonic has traveled, traveled through time with the help of objects, but yeah. Barry's just traveled through time on his own. I mean, you could argue that Barry or any of the Flash just tapping into the Speed Force is kind of the equivalent of Sonic tapping into the Chaos Emeralds. Sure. But Barry's ability is to tap into the speed force. It That is his power. It's not just super speed. The super speed is derivative of that force. So that is kind of inclusive in this power set. It's not just the augmented. Are not. It's just, hmm? Yeah, it's not just augmented by things. It is that thing. Like, right. Whereas so, Sonic has to pull in other objects to really jelly and jam as the saying was. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sure there will be people who, you know, pull out citations of various Sonic things saying, well, he did this at this point in this comic cartoon or whatever. And sure, I'm 
that's the beauty about this ridiculous media <laughs> that we're in is that you can find an example of anything. But I think overall, if you boil it down to just the brass tacks, it should be Flash would win in a race. Just remember, Ian, it's just a show. You should really <laughs> just relax or comic book or movie or other form of media. You should really just relax. It's fine. No, it's, I'm it's cool. slowly, slowly learning. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> uh, it's a great mantra. I try to live by that mantra every day. It's just life. You should really just relax. It's hard to do that, though, for me. Oh, I, yeah. It's hard to do that for me, but I, I'm, I'm always learning. <laughs> All right, let's get jump into the standard Q&A. First one comes from Jesus A. If you were to make an adaptation of Mega Man X, 5, and 6, what would you do? Have X and Zero go through the same adventure, uh, since they originally have their own paths. Uh, talk about how the space colony Eurasia crashed into Earth. Or would you, and how would you write uh, Zero's resurrection in X six uh, while staying true to the original storyline and adding some details? That is an excellent question and one I am not prepared to answer <laughs> off the top of my head. I did back when I was writing the Mega Man comic, and the possibility of an X book was kind of on the fringe. I did start to do some research and figure out how I would approach each one. And by the time you get to like the X5, X6 era, it's like, oh. It's very convoluted. It just goes downhill quick. And, you know, bridging that and the Zero series is just like, eventually what we would have to do is just pick a course and go with it, you know? There's no way to be 100% faithful to the games, whether it's acknowledging every permutation of the storyline, every variable ending, or <laughs> even keeping up with some of the contradictions that are within the games themselves. So right. um, I would have to like sit down and re-research the games to give you a better answer, Jesus. Uh, I, From what I remember of researching X4, I was really excited for in the prospects of delving into Repla Force and seeing mm -hmm. how it contrasted with the hunters and the fact that the entire battle is more or less down to pride and how tragic the whole thing is. And that would have been really neat to get into with Sigma not necessarily being the big bad as usual, but more of a looming ideal until he actually shows up and is the big bad. But you know what I mean? It's the real... <laughs> The real enemy of the story is pride between the two groups, and that, I think, would have been really neat to delve into. As for 5 and 6, I'd have to, again, I'd really have to dig into it to before I even began to speculate. Well, if you didn't have Zero in an X4 adaptation screaming, What am I fighting for? <laughs> then I'm afraid you would have failed. I mean, like... With X2, what I would have liked to have done is kind of do both scenarios so that Zero comes back, but actually have him face off against Black Metal Zero or Nightmare Zero, whatever his official name is. And Sure. <laughs> you know, just kind of fudge it a little bit, play with I don't know. I That is not looking likely anytime soon, sadly, but uh, hope springs eternal. Indeed. Next question comes from Dark Vengeance Zero. I know I brought up Sonic Underground before, but can we expect an IDW version of Alina the Hedgehog to appear in the new comics? Not likely. Uh, Sega, specifically Sega of Japan, really, really, really doesn't like acknowledging previous spinoffs. Uh, you know, whether it be cartoons or um, other nuances of the franchise they they once it's done they kind of like to keep it done that's part of why the archie book was such an oddball thing um a lot of what was in it was thanks to a very very old contract and uh a lot of let's not point out 
where some of the stuff comes from. Let's just put it in the book and uh, float it out there, and hopefully no one will notice. <laughs> so, but IDW is a completely different uh, contract and scenario than the old book was. So, I'm not going to say no, never, because as we've stressed on the show a lot this season, the book is brand new. We're developing a new relationship with Sega, and that can lead to things in the future. But I wouldn't, you know, stay up late waiting for it to happen. All right. Next question comes from Diligent Dodo. Bumble Lumble Chumble Cast. We all know Ian loves to work lyrics from the Sonic theme songs in IDW, and I was wondering if Whisper and Tangle had theme songs, what would they sound like? Oh, boy. Um, Tangle would be some kind of really obnoxious, upbeat ska. (laughs) Something that literally has you bouncing off the walls. Yeah. Uh, Whisper, I'm just going to say Call Into the Night from Metal Gear. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> for now we'll just put that as a placeholder for now until- uh, it, there's kind of a kind of a stylistic similarity i suppose yeah we'll, we'll go with that all right next question comes from ernest panda do you have stuff like game timelines general lore and world maps planned out for idw sonic if so for the timeline part how much does it differ differ from post sgw archie are there any games left out are any of them in a different order than before uh, I'm approaching IDW Sonic different from Archie Sonic, where Archie Sonic was very lore heavy at its base. IDW Sonic, I'm approaching as more as a adventure by adventure model, in part because again, this is a very different scenario. So, I Sega of Japan has a much closer eye on the way we do things in the comic. And I don't have quite as much latitude to just make things up on the fringe. Uh, I think I've tried to get the world map hammered out multiple times over the years. And I think I'm going to just give up at this point (laughs) because, you know, there, there is no consistent map for either planet, whether it's Sonic world or the human world. Like, the map that you see in Shadow the Hedgehog does not match the map from Sonic Unleashed. The planet that you see in Sonic Forces doesn't match the map that's in the Babylon Rogues Blimp, which is a plain old B-flat Earth map. So there is no map. There is no solid (laughs) world geography to call upon. And uh, it's like you say, you got to learn to relax and... (laughs) The geography never really has become a huge sticking point in the games. So I'm just kind of rolling with that. We know Angel Island is in the air. That's about as far as we get. World Uh, world maps are really hard because you just, you can't, it's like almost impossible to adhere to them just on principle. I, I, it, you can do it, but It's tough, and there's really no reason to do so. I mean, you could have some sort of basic idea of where things are, and you know, but maybe it's a little fluid, and you can kind of move stuff around as needed. I I don't think stuff being in specific locations uh, for everything is necessarily super important. Like, if you're watching like say a Marvel movie or like even agents of shield, like they're flying all the way around the world. Like they might as well just be teleporting everywhere. And it's fine. Cause that that's not the point. The point isn't where are they? The point is what are they doing more than anything else to me? Anyway, that's kind of how I've always felt about it. And it's especially hard with Sonic when they can add new regions at any point. Uh, well, yeah, right. that too. So, you know, we thought we had seen all of Angel Island back in the classic Genesis stuff, and then they add stuff to it in Sonic Advance 3, so... Yeah, or you go into Sonic Adventure, and all of a sudden Angel Island is, like, uh, the size of a small house. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's like, Or a completely different shape, or... And it's like, what? What is going on here? I don't get it. 
<laughs> X for a timeline, yeah, you can consider it completely different than Volume 2 of the Archie Sonic. Um, something that I'm trying to get to stick out there is the idea of a Volume 1 and a Volume 2. Because I don't like referring to the eras by the Genesis wave. It feels like, I don't know, to me, making the distinction of a plot point is harder for outside folks to understand. So you've got your volume one, which was all the different writers and editors and contributors over the years that went up to a point that was very uniquely its own kind of book. Mm -hmm. And then volume two, where it was mostly me running things, but with other contributors and a very different feel and uh, mindset behind the creation of the narrative. So that's why I'm making this distinction to volume one, volume two. Uh, volume two is definitely a different timeline than IDW Sonic. IDW Sonic is looser in that we have the new idea that classic Sonic is both the past and a different dimension. So one has to wonder at what point does the diversion happen? And you could make a good case that it's Sonic Generations, which I think would be clear division, but there could be another game that comes along that throws monkey wrench into that. So what counts as past and what counts as canon is somewhat fluid. For now, I would say that if you really, really want to think of it this way, you can kind of consider the modern era game in their release order is roughly the inspirational timeline. It is not the timeline because the comics are not canon to the games. I need to stress that because that seems to be hard for some folks to accept. The comics are inspired by the games, but they are their own thing. So events of the games may have happened to the comic, but in a somewhat different way. Right. And events of the comics uh, may not be reflected in the games. So, Oh, they never will. Probably not. <laughs> Most likely not. I <laughs> We can hope, but I doubt it. I See, I'm going to say no, never, and then tomorrow they're going to announce something. Oh, well, I'm a liar. Great, thanks. Yeah, well, we've already got people who think you're lying. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> are we ready to get into the last question speaking, yeah, go of, for speaking it. of that Ian <laughs> go for it <laughs> alright uh, I will treat your question fairly but I mean you, okay anyway never mind sorry uh, from Triforce Kid curious to know which of these supposed mandates by Sega you actually intend to obey since you've broken every single one you've mentioned in the past you think Sega would be pretty pissed at you adding characters to the lore who don't exist, as per their so-called mandate. Alrighty, so... <laughs> <laughs> Number one, the mandates are not a hard and fast rule nailed to the editorial door. <laughs> now, Archie and IDW did not receive a fax or a PDF that says, Thou shalt not... Do such and such. Ian, you're breaking the law here. Sega is the law, don't you know? <laughs> it, it's stuff that all the writers have had to deal with before I came onto the book. I mean, I remember being on the old forums and Ken Penders and Carl Bowlers talking about the stuff that they had to deal with in terms of whatever Sega would or wouldn't allow. I don't know if they use the exact word mandates. It's been 12 years but <laughs> they were dealing with the same stuff i was to, to, some, to some degree and you know other writers tracy yardley Ed and stanley leah baker they can all tell you they've run into their fair share of stuff too i ran into more because i've simply written more uh and number oh, what are we on number two number three anyway uh those rules are not set in stone you know as we said before on the show Cream and Omega were off limits. You know, that's a mandate right there. I cannot use them because of whatever reason. And then we could. Um, you know, the famous one, Sonic Cannot Cry, which got tratted out around, oh, was it, what was the wedding arc? 155? 
Yeah, somewhere before around there. I, I, I guess. It's before you came on, I think. That, you know, we... That was because they really took Sonic in a direction that Japan was comfortable with. But since then, we were able to approach Sonic having more than a one-note emotion in different ways. Uh, and I don't know exactly what Triforce Kid is referring to in terms of adding characters to the lore, then that was a mandate. I Literally, I'm not trying to be obtuse. I don't know exactly what he's referring to. Like, we can't go in and say, this is the origin of the Chaos Emeralds. Except when we did. But that is... It also depends on who's looking at it, you know? If Sega of America is doing the approvals, they're usually a little more understanding about us massaging the narrative, whereas Sega of Japan is much more uh, attentive to the details. Uh, And that varies from project to project, uh, game to game. You know, when a new game is coming out, typically they're more attentive to the finer details. When there is a large lull in game production, like that magical period when there were no Genesis games and like extreme was canceled. So there was nothing really Sonic related from 95 to 99. Oh man, what was it like for them then? Hardly imagine. <laughs> you know, we're uh, nowadays we're working under the rule that Knuckles is the last echidna. Well, clearly that wasn't enforced back in the day, but you know, rules and attentiveness changes from era to era and whatever the license holder feels like they want to enforce. Uh, and sometimes yeah, I tried to sneak a little something under the radar. If I that it's, you know, better for the narrative. Uh, there's <laughs> uh, uh, hold on. Uh, Can I jump in real quick, Ian? I just wanted to yeah. say that um, the books are not like snuck by Sega. Before, oh, absolutely! Like, when they were re- when they're released, like Sega approves everything that's in the books before they come out. It's not like Down Sega. It's not like Sega. Lines of dialogue. Yeah, it's not like Sega doesn't know what's going on, and you're just doing things over here. In that, and you're just like you're just lying about it. You're like just saying, "Oh, Sega says I can't do this," and, but secretly you're just like, "I don't want to do that. I'm just going to sneak it out." I'm just gonna sneak it out like a, like a like a fart, and Sega will never notice. <laughs> I'm sneak me, it out. There are... I'm sneak it out like a fart in a public place. It's, it's, it's not how that works. I don't. I don't think you understand. The, the book has to get approved before it comes out. Sega goes over this stuff. They look at it. They know what's going on. They approve the new characters that you make. They they approve everything it's it's not just like oh i can just sneak this by it's like no sega if they don't want something in the book it's probably not gonna go in (laughs) it's most likely not there are some very cathartic rants i could go on on stuff that was approved in one book but was rejected the next month but Um, was fine the month after that yeah but that would make very important people not happy with me and i really this job so it's all part and parcel with the job it's you know the licensor says what is and isn't okay and it is up to them to enforce that i just try to color inside the lines as best i can interpretively maybe but now (laughs) triforce kid goes on to say on their twitter to speculate if they could use the freedom of information act to expose me for my fraudulent lies over the mandates and their very existence. I don't know what you're lying about. What could you possibly be lying about? But okay, sure. The, me and everyone who's ever worked on the book. But that, no, 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 no. I, I'm being legitimate here, Kyle. I know. I know. I, I, gl- I glanced at it. I agree with you. I glanced at it, and the proponents of the Freedom of Information Act say that while it is only been used for the government, it is technically able to be used on private businesses so long as their material is in the public domain, I believe. I, I'm no lawyer. It just hasn't been tried yet. So while I sincerely doubt a bit, of, a bit of U.S. legislation can be applied to a private Japanese company, 
But by all means, go after SAG of America. Please. I'm being 100% legitimate. Get a lawyer and file a motion through the Freedom of Information Act against Sega of America to not only settle this mandate thing to ease your mind, but to set the legal precedent for the United States over a comic book. I am not mocking you. I am being 100% legit here. Go for it. Do it. Because I want to be able to look up on the Wikipedia page of the Freedom of Information Act and see... That, you know, in 2020, the legal precedent for the use against private companies was because of a comic book. That just, ah, that would be phenomenal. That would be hilarious. So please, go for it. Absolutely. Do it. Lawyer up, buddy. (laughs) Uh, I'm glad you're serious. (laughs) And I hope it happens. If you can make it, it, if you can make it happen, buddy. If you got the money to lawyer up, and believe me, lawyers are not cheap. (laughs) They are not cheap. Uh, I'd be, I'd be serious. It's like that. um, It's like that protein that they found that was vaguely shaped like Sonic's head. So they called it, you know, Sonic Hedgehog. And then the uh, antivirus or the inhibitor that they invented to stop it, they called it like robotnacine or something. That cracks me up. That's phenomenal. So please, if you really think that I have orchestrated this conspiracy of lies across a half dozen creators, even before I was working on the book to establish this notion that, that the licensor has rules that they sometimes enforce, and you want to take it to court at that level, absolutely go for it because I want that precedent set. That would be amazing. Do it. Do it now. (laughs) All right. And on that note, I think this is a good place to end this episode of the Bumblecast. I think so. Kyle, where can they find you when the show is done? I'll be lawyering up and going in for a freedom of information request on this show (laughs) ian i have information that i need from you and as a canadian slash american joint venture (laughs) i believe i have jurisdiction to request the information from you that you've kept that you've kept deliberately hidden from me ian this information that you've kept away from me except keep it classy kyle come on except you haven't never mind i'm sorry uh, if you think I'm classy, then you got another thing coming, and you can go find out at KyleJCRB on Twitter, or at KNGI.org, where you can listen to my other show, Nitro Game Injection, which streams live Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, also over at KNGI.org. Uh, that particular show is where you can find out just how classy I am. Uh, pro tip, it, it's I'm not classy at all. Where can people find you, Ian? <laughs> You can find me at BumbleKing.com or on Twitter at Ian Flynn BKC. And of course, don't forget, you can follow the show at BumbleCast on Twitter. And uh, hit up BumbleCast at Yahoo.com if you're interested in uh, asking a question or entering into the Bumble raffle. You can help support the show by buying some Bumble merchandise over at the Bumble store. Head over to shop.spreadshirt.com backslash Bumble store. Don't forget, we also do uh, Patreon-exclusive BumbleCast gaming live streams on Sundays. Uh, we're, we've been in discussions of possibly moving the day and or the time. It's kind of fluid right now, but we always announce when we're going to be going live. So uh, if you're interested, head on over to Patreon.com slash BumbleCast and uh, join in the fun. And of course, oh, go ahead. oh I want to also mention Ian. That uh, I am, I have started to use the Twitch stream a little bit. I've dabbled in it uh, as of this week, the week we're recording this. Um, I am been playing. I've only played one day this week. I might play tomorrow or something. Tomorrow being time. <laughs> time is weird when you're pre-recording stuff. Anyway, <laughs> I may be playing more Overwatch. I started out Overwatch. Um, like, I'm a complete noob at the game. Complete and total noob. I played like an hour of it before I started streaming it. <laughs> so, if you want to watch someone who has no idea what they're doing 
play play Overwatch. <laughs> Head on over to twitch.tv slash bumblecast gaming and check us out. It's it was fun. I had a good time. I actually was getting the hang of one character. But uh, I haven't really dabbled. Like one down, fifty to go. I haven't dabbled in any of the other ones really too much yet. So we'll see what happens. But um, I'm kind of surprised that I chose a support character to go with, and I'm actually having a good time and uh, doing okay with a support character. Usually, I'm like I hate. I don't really care for healing or whatever. But Overwatch is like just really easy. Just point and click, and things happen. It's 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 not bad. I like it. <laughs> It's it's not difficult to keep an eye on things and what's going on. It's it's definitely frantic and hectic, but it's a lot of fun. So check that out. Before we wrap up, we're going to give a big shout out to everyone who makes this show possible. Thank you to Daniel H, Eric F, Alex P, Zanos, Duas Dizdin, Scruffy Matt, Chris A, John B, Sam Cybercat, Samuel P, Jennifer R, David C, Robin White, Lisa M, Mike B, Joshua S, Dragon Superfan, Digama F, Wow, A E Double. M, Neil H, Justin S, Justin G, Dan M S, Adam T, Silly String, Takaro, B H K, Chevelle, Don B, Sin Fritz, Tuckel El Gato Comics, John M, James K, Papa Drippadabas, Overthinking Films, Adam B T, and Kyle. Ron. That's gonna wrap us up for Bumblecast episode eighty one. We'll see you in a couple weeks for the next episode where we're gonna talk about I don't know something. Good night. What is this? What are we even doing, Ian? I I, I don't know, dude. I I'd, I'd say cut it after goodnight. <laughs> what am I even doing? <laughs> what is this? What are these moods I get in when we record the show? Joy. Ah, uh, that might be it. It's weird. I'm not used to it. <laughs> You're just having a good time. I'm having way too much of a good time, man. It's weird. I don't like it. I, I'm going to be not happy anymore. Okay, is that all right? <laughs> Do whatever you want. I, I don't think whatever I'm... makes you happy. <laughs> Damn it! No, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it, Ian. I can't do it. I have too much fun recording this show. I can't do it. I just can't. Nah. Hey, thanks for listening to the Bumblecast. If you like the show, be sure to hit that subscribe button and consider supporting us on Patreon. We have some great rewards as well as big plans to make the show even better. Also, rate and review the show on iTunes. It gets more folks listening and really helps us out, so we definitely appreciate it. Original music by Ken Coda Snyder, used with permission. Find more of his music at bc.s3m.us and find the theme song at noisechanradio.bandcamp.com. Available as a pay-what-you-want download.